SM and Visor 1 found themselves on an active battlefield and were soon dodging bullets and explosives. They remained unnoticed, but their ship ended up slipping into a crater, and while SM focused on getting the ship running again, Visor 1 couldn't help but watch the battle with bated breath reverse engineering weapons and battle tactics in her head, with the combined reverence of a military tactician learning new tactics and a zoologist discovering a brand new species. Essam emerged and climbed up beside me. They make war on each other, he said. Humans and humans? Yes, so it would seem. The battle had left me feeling conflicted. It had been wild and exhilarating. But there was a sad dimension as well. Their weapons were primitive, but powerful. Given the great numbers the humans could call on, they might be formidable. If so, if humans were too powerful to conquer, my future was death. Quick from Dracon execution, or slow from some sure death assignment. Essam said it out loud. Are they class four, Subvisor? I shook my head. No, Essam. I will find the way. I will find the way to conquer them. And I already know one thing. What is that, Subvisor? I watched the swift moving machines that even now had closed on the fleeing prey and continued its annihilation in detail, explosions like flowers in the night. I pointed at the victors, the swift, confident pursuers. If we want Earth, we must start with them. The next step is to isolate a human being and attempt to infest it. They found a Middle Eastern soldier and chased him down, nabbed him, and Visor 1 proceeded to leave her hork host and infest the new guy. The next couple of chapters are pretty amazing, to the point where I just want to read the entire thing out loud to you without commentary. It's an alien perspective on human anatomy and the functions of the brain. An explorer crossing an unknown territory, a scientist on the verge of a breakthrough, all rolled into one. It gives us the most detailed description of infestation to date, and shows Visor 1 on the first steps in figuring out an alternative way of conquering without using blunt force. Then, I discovered something strange and disturbing. A huge, deep chasm. It seemed to separate the human brain into two halves, and between the halves was only a nerve bundle not much thicker than my own true body. Two halves? Why? Why would the human brain be divided in halves? It was a rational design. It made no sense. Unless... This was a fully redundant system that would allow the creature to function in the events that half its brain was destroyed? Tentatively, I reached toward the far side of the brain. I touched it. Made contact. Fascinating. It was incredible. This second half of the brain was an almost mirror image, but not. It could have functioned all on its own, if necessary, and yet it was in some ways radically different in its memories, its sensory interpretation, even its will. Two almost entirely functional brains in one skull, communicating across a channel of nerves. Not a fully redundant system, almost a second, different brain. Why? It had to involve specialization of some sort, and yet I found visual and auditory functions on both sides. I found memory on both sides, found motor control on both sides. It was then that I knew I was seeing something new. This brain worked by dialectic. Each half of the brain saw and heard and smelled and touched a slightly different world. Each tended toward specialization, but not a hard, fast split. The left half had more language, but not all the language. The right side had more spatial perception, but not all of the spatial perception. Confusion, disorder, illogic. This mind could argue with itself. This mind could see the same event in different ways. It was insanity. A democratic brain arguing within itself with no sure, certain control, only a sort of uneasy compromise a consensus of disputatious elements. This brain contained its own traitor. So Visor 1 goes through the human's memories, discovers he's a painter and a soldier with a family. She gathered all the information this man knew of the world and governments and the present war, and determined that they'll need to conquer the bigger nations involved first, 
and that means starting with Murica. The memory broadcast is put on pause for a brief recess, leaving Visor 1 and 3 alone with each other. Visor 3 tries a frankly pathetic attempt at a We shouldn't be enemies, we should join forces and overthrow the council and take over the Yurk Empire! Ha 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 ha! speech in hoping to record Visor 1 saying something damning. And Visor 1 is insulted that he thinks she's that stupid. It's a sign of desperation. Visor 3 has lost complete control of the trial due to his own hubris, and now he's resorting to schemes Turl used in Battlefield Earth. I understand you perfectly, Esplin 9466. You have the necessary brutality without the necessary subtlety. You are crude and emotional. You've made no progress on Earth. None. For all your grandiose schemes, you are no further towards your goal than when you took over. The break ends and the memory broadcast continues. So the first human host was destroyed and SM and Visor 1 went in search for America. But supplies were dwindling fast, especially water. Yeah, no idea where you could get water. Nope, you got me there. In one of Visor 1's less thought out moments, she decided not to take half a day finding an unguarded source of water and restocking, but instead opting to spend time in orbit sifting through broadcast signals to try and map out a rough geography of the world. So, between broadcasts of Blossom and Wheel of Fortune, Visa One managed to pinpoint Mirica and its most powerful city, Hollywood! They landed and went for the first house with a swimming pool they came across. Two problems. One, Essam didn't check to see if the water was actually drinkable and winds up screaming in agony over all the chlorine in his eyes. And two, there were two people already there a middle-aged television producer named Lonestein, and a struggling actress-slash-drug addict named Jenny Lines. Wait, a, a drug addict named Jenny Lines? Eesh, did you go to the Werewolf Chronicles book of character naming for that one? Oh, you don't get the reference? Well, maybe if you were watching my other videos, hmm? The two Hollywood types just assumed the hork in their backyard are new special effects for a movie, so Visor 1 and SM managed to jump Jenny and Lonestein, respectively, and infest them, destroying the old hork bodies before anyone else saw them. So now Visor 1 has moved on from cannon fodder to drug-addled Z-lister, and you can guess this didn't give her the most positive sense of humanity ever, but it did contribute to Visor 1's running theory, that human beings have a natural tendency towards subservience. With the soldier, it was service to the state, to nationalism, and socially constructed family obligations. With the actress, it was a chemical dependency, and an entertainment industry that she probably fucked a producer or two to get into. The way Visor 1 sees it, we've evolved into a race of natural slaves. That's not an entirely inaccurate observation. Lots of people, dare I say most people, are raised to be instinctively submissive to certain ideas like patriotism, faith, or authority. The implication, however, is that human beings are genetically disposed to submission, which takes us all the way back to the arguments of number 19, The Departure, implying that all creatures, earthborn or otherwise, are beholden to the roles they've been given through evolution. The Yurks are natural parasites, humans are naturally omnivores, that song and dance. However, this idea just doesn't hold water. Submission in humans is a cultural trait, not a genetic one. What use is submission to survival? You can find hierarchies in nature, but that concerns a group, and how an animal may function in a group does not necessarily translate to how they'll function in isolation. You can isolate wolves, breed what appear to be the most submissive among them for generations, train them from birth to accept you as their master and means of survival, and there's still no guarantee that the resulting dog will never bite you. But, you know, it's still a better tactic than nuking it from orbit and letting God sort it out. This ends the memory broadcast. Nothing after this point was recorded. Gareth accurately points out that these early assumptions about human beings turned out to be way off the mark, since the majority of human hosts are those that had to be taken by force. Visor 1 could seize this, but still lays the blame on the Yurk's failure to conquer Earth on Visor 3. And, well, can you blame her? While she was plotting the conquest of the Liren homeworld, Visor 3 was wrangling dust monsters as bloodhounds. Visor 3 stresses to the Council that Visor 1's tactics haven't worked, and there must be a movement towards all-out war immediately, which Visor 1 responds rather negatively towards. So, that was it. 
That was Visitor Three's goal. All out war. No, I couldn't allow that. It would result in the deaths of millions, which was irrelevant to me, but it also might result in the deaths of two. Two humans I would not allow to be killed. I stood up and shook my mangled fist at Visitor Three. This fool would strip away the secrecy that has allowed us to make progress on Earth. We cannot hope to win an easy victory over a population of billions. It's Visitor Three's turn to take advantage of emotional outbursts and starts accusing Visitor One of deliberately holding back the invasion. And there might be a hidden truth to that. But suddenly, a bear and tiger and two horkbidger burst into the room and start attacking everything. It's the Andalite bandits. Visitor Three and his Horkvisier troops start swarming in to deal with this threat, while Visitor One is helpless. But something isn't quite right. The animals aren't acting intelligently, and when the tiger winds up attacking the bear, Visitor One realizes that these aren't the Andalite bandits, but a couple of animals that Visitor Three starved to put on as a show. Visitor Three kills the animals, and the council is impressed, thinking he just killed the Andalite bandits. Suddenly... There's a lot less doubt in Visor 3's loyalty to the Empire. All the progress Visor 1 had made? Gone. There's only one way to make this work in her favor. She's going to have to find a way to contact Marco and get the real Andalite bandits here. But Visor 3 has more bad news. It's that time in all fictional trials when they bring in the surprise witness. Yes. I have the testimony of someone who was close to Visor 1 during this critical time. A witness? Who? SM293. I try not to show any reaction. Surely the Visor knows that SM is dead. Visor 3 looked away from the hologram. He smiled an unsettling Andalite smile that is done with eyes alone. No, Visor 1. SM293 is not dead. At least not entirely. Guards, bring in the witness. Well, it turns out not to be Essam exactly, but Essam's human host during the lost year between the end of Visor 1's memory recording and Visor 1 reconnecting with the Yurk Empire. A clearly crazed man by the name of Hildy Gervais. He's clearly an alcoholic, another example of human submission, but while it's not usually couth to bring a wino into court, Hildy seems to know things he shouldn't including the name of Visor 1's post-Jenny Lines host, Allison Kim. Then... Oh, yes, I remember her, the human said. See, she was Essam's wife. He was in love with her. Visor lowered his thought-speak voice to an insinuating whisper. And she, this Allison Kim, this Edris 562, this Subvisor 409... She was in love with him as well? Yes, yes, Essam was sure of that. Mostly, anyway. See, if he hadn't been sure, he'd never have gone ahead with it. With what? The babies. They're kids. See, they had kids. Twins. A little girl and a little boy. And with that, the entire focus of the trial changes. The idea that Visor One had children through a human host and not to maintain the disguise, is unsettling. Suddenly, there is a motive in why Visor One might attempt to slow or halt the invasion of Earth to protect those children. And Eva is loving this. She's been trapped inside her own head this entire time, throwing the occasional insult and insight, and now she sees the writing on the wall. Visor One is in a corner, and soon she'll be found guilty and Eva will finally be released from her pain in death. The only thing Visor 1 can do now is play for time, so she continues her story. She had decided that while Jenny Lines was good for getting to know human weakness, another perspective was needed, and a new set of resources to get operations going was also needed. So she zoned in on Allison Kim, a scientist who was in Hollywood as a technical advisor. So she got Allison invited to a pool party at Lowenstein's place, and while both of them were in the pool, she grabbed Kim and transferred herself from one host to the other. I began to disengage from Jenny Lines. I withdrew from that empty brain, keeping just one control contact till the very end. 
stretched now between the two humans, half touching Allison, half touching Jenny, I gave a last instruction to Jenny Lines. I made Jenny breathe. Damn, that's cold. So Vision 1 continued her time on Earth with no apparent goal, testing the various strengths and weaknesses of the human conviction, and she came to a startling conclusion that most humans would rather be dead than be controlled. Allison Kim was no Jenny Lines, and tests in giving her momentary control resulted in Allison attempting to kill both of them. Human beings would put up a fight, and Visual One makes it clear that while the Yerks would win in such a conflict, the humans are capable enough to make such a thing foolhardy. There are more than five billion of them, Visor. I shot back, and you may deride their projectile weapons, but a 9mm bullet will kill a hork badger host quite effectively. And taxons or geds? A taxon can be killed with a can opener. Visor 3 pushes that the human race could be awed to submit in fear to their military might, but Visor 1 shoots that idea down pretty quickly, and scores a minor point by bringing up the hork badger chronicle's continuity. I forced a derisive laugh. It's ironic, Vizzer, that you, you of all years, you who rose to prominence by stunning the Andalites when no one else would, have turned so stupid when it comes to dealing with humans. Vizzer three blinked his large Andalite eyes. He knew I made a point at his expense. He had no answer. This, of course, raises the question of how we got from the Visor 3 scene in the Hork Bishop Chronicles to the Visor 3 we see today. And at least this discrepancy between the two is acknowledged, even if we never get a clear answer for it. Uh, just throw that onto the pile of things I intend to address in my big thesis for this book here in a couple of minutes. Visor 3 isn't keen on taking any more points against himself, so he presses for a new memory scan to be made to get to the bottom of this. By law, nobody can be forced to submit to such a scan, but Gareth offers a deal. Do the scan, and every charge minus the one for treason will be dropped. I mean, the, the main treason charge, not all those secondary uh, treason for not mopping up that spell charges. Visor 1 finds herself in a corner. If she refuses, she'll be found guilty. If she accepts, she can't hide anything, and she'll be found guilty. With Gareth running the scan, and not Visor 3, she begrudgingly agrees to it, 